Hello, and thank you for joining me today. My name is Derek Kane, and today I'm going to give an introduction to artificial neural networks. This presentation is just one presentation in a broader series of lectures uh, designed to go into topics of machine learning, predictive analytics, data mining, and statistics. If you like this presentation, feel free to subscribe to the channel and check out the other videos. Okay, let's begin. The overview of topics which we'll get into today will include a brief history of neural networks, we'll talk about the biological information processes to understand really how these machine learning techniques are performing. We have to understand a little bit about how the brain functions. Then we'll jump into the topics of artificial neural networks themselves. We'll talk about modeling artificial neurons, the hidden layers of an artificial neural network, then we'll get into multi-layer neural networks, and then the back propagation. Afterwards, we'll jump into the topics uh, using practical applications. And we'll actually go through uh, three, three types of practical examples. A binary response, a time series, and a categorization exercise. The history of artificial neural networks is actually uh, very rich. It traces back to the 1950s, but it really kind of became popular in the 1980s with the work by uh, Rummelhart, Hinton, and McIland. A general framework for parallel distributed processing in parallel distributed processing, explorations in the microstructure of cognition. And this is the main work that kind of jump started the neural network movement. Okay, and there are hundreds of variants to the approach, and it's really, it's less a model of the actual brain than a useful tool, but there's still some debate on the subject. Now, there are numerous applications for neural networks. Uh, we use it in handwriting recognition, facial recognition, speech recognition processes, uh, self-driving vehicles, and models of reading, sentence production, and dreaming. Neural networks take their inspiration from biological processes. Okay. Computers are great at solving algorithmic and math problems, but often the real world can, can't can easily be defined with a mathematical algorithm. For example, facial recognition and language processing are a couple of examples of problems that can't easily be quantified into an algorithm. However, these tasks are trivial to humans. We take our language and our ability to recognize patterns for granted but to, in the, the context of machine learning, that this can prove to be quite tricky. The key to artificial neural networks is that their design enables them to process information in a similar way to our own biological brains by drawing inspiration from how our own nervous system functions. And this makes them useful tools for solving problems like facial recognition, which our biological brains can do easily. And essentially, what these tools allow for us to do is we can take a number of input variables and if we don't understand exactly what the relationship is between these input variables and the response variable, uh, it's, it's sort of a black box technique that we can use. And sometimes uh, artificial neural networks can be very powerful tools in our, in our analytical toolbox. Animals are able to react adaptively to changes in their external and internal environment, and they use their nervous systems to perform these behaviors. An appropriate model or simulation of the nervous system should be able to produce similar responses and behaviors in artificial systems. The nervous system is built by relatively simple units, the neurons. So copying their behavior and functionality should be the solution. And if we're trying to mimic a biological process, uh, starting with the neurons and really innately understanding how they're functioning in the brain uh, it has led to the development of this technique. Now let's talk a little bit more about neurons in the brain so we can understand. So 
Although heterogeneous, at a low level, the brain is composed of neurons. A neuron receives input from other neurons, generally thousands of them, uh, from its synapses. Inputs are approximately summed. When the input exceeds a threshold, the neuron sends an electrical spike that travels from the body down the axon to the next neuron. The figure shows a model of the synapse, showing the chemical messages of the synapse moving from the axon to the dendrite. Synapses are not simply a transmission medium for chemical signals, however. A synapse is capable of modifying itself based on the signal traffic that it receives. In this way, a synapse is able to learn from its past activity. This learning happens through the strengthening or weakening of a connection. External factors can also affect the chemical properties of the synapse, including body chemistry and medication. And this is a, an important idea. So when I'm looking at a neuron and I have an axon, and it's, it's connecting to a dendrite of another neuron, depending on the task at hand or the changes in the environment, the connection alters. So if something is working well and the brain wants to reinforce that, that particular activity, it strengthens that connection. But if it's finding that a particular activity isn't producing the, the response that it wants, then it might loosen that connection and form a connection with another neuron that's a little stronger. Let's talk a little more about the biological learning processes in the brain. And this is a very stripped down version of how brains learn. First, they alter the strength between neurons. They create and delete connections between the neurons. Then we get into the topic of Hebbian learning, which is when an axon of cell A is near enough to excite a cell B and repeatedly or persistently takes part in firing it. it some growth process or metabolic change takes place in one or both cells, such that A's efficiency, as one of the cells firing it to B, is increased. Then we get into the topic of long-term potentiation, or LTP, and this is the cellular basis for learning and memory. And LTP is the long-lasting strengthening of the connection between two nerve cells in response to stimulation. In a very pared down sense, we have neurons that they fire, and then when they connect it to another neuron, uh, those connections essentially are evolving and constantly taking shape, learning and adapting from the environment, and the information is recorded and encoded in the cells. And LTP has been discovered in many regions of the cortex. Now that we've talked about the biological aspects of a neural network, I'd like to get into the topic of artificial neural networks and their applications in machine learning. An artificial neural network model, at their core, are simplified models based on biological neurons. And this allows for them to capture the essence of how a biological neuron functions. We usually refer to these artificial neurons as perceptrons. And the basic idea is that we have a series of inputs. And these are just variables from our data set. Uh, but we can think of them as neurons in this case. So these inputs go through and they're weighted in some way. And we'll talk about the weights in, in later slides. Then the summation of the weights of these particular inputs are summed, and then there's an activation of function. And that basically is triggering whether or not the neuron should fire. And if it should fire yes or no, then it creates a certain output. So in the crudest sense, this is what an artificial neural network actually is doing. A typical perceptron will have many inputs 
and these inputs are all individually weighted. So as we can see on our image on the right hand side, we now have these inputs, one for each perceptron, they have their own weights, then we have what's called the transfer function, and that's essentially looking at the total summation of the weights of the individual neurons, then we have a net input weight, and then we have the activation function, which triggers yes or no based off of a certain threshold criteria, which we specify in, in the neural network. The perceptron weights can either amplify or de-amplify the original input signal. For example, if the input variable is a 1 and the input's weight is 0 0.2, then the input would be decreased to 0 0.2. So these weights influence the quality of the the source data that's flowing through on how this particular neural network is learning and using the information. Okay, so the weights are an extremely important aspect of how a neural network functions. These weighted signals are then added together and passed into the activation function. The activation function is useful to convert the input into a more useful output. There are many different types of activation functions but one of the simplest would be a step function. And a step function will typically output a one if the input is higher than a certain threshold, otherwise this output would be a zero. So we're taking a series of inputs, we're running it through the transfer function to the activation function, which simply put is giving us a yes or no, a binary response, and that's what the step function performs. So let's dive into how this example works a little bit. Imagine I have two inputs in this case, and for my first input I have a value of 0 0.6, and then I have a weight of 1 of 0 0.5. Then on input 2 I have an initial value of 1.0, and the weight 2 has a value of 0 0.8. My threshold, I'm, dis uh, I'm using 1 in this case. What we do is we multiply the weight, the inputs by their weights, and then we sum them. So in this case, I take 0 0.6 times 0 0.5, 1.0 times 0 0.8, and then the total is 1.1. Because our result of 1.1 is greater than the activation threshold of 1.0, this neuron is activated and it fires. And in this case, it could be the binary response of a yes or no. So what does an artificial neural network look like and how it uses these artificial neurons to process the information? As you can probably tell from the diagram, it's called a feed-forward network because of how the signals are passed through the layers of the neural network in a single direction. These aren't the only types of neural networks, though. We will focus on the feed-forward networks and how their design links our perceptron together, creating a functioning artificial neural network. And this is called a feedforward neural network really because we have inputs that are being put in at one level. Then there's a hidden layer of connections, which is essentially another input layer that we're pre-specifying that is helping to take the noise out of the input layer to move us to our output layer, which is really the binary response. And what's interesting about this is that we're not just going straight from the input to our response, that there is actually a hidden black box layer that is adjusting the, the, the noise, if you will, of, of the data, and it's reshaping it in a way that makes sense to the output connection. Okay. So for implementing artificial neural networks, each input from the input layer is fed up to each node in the hidden layer, and then from there, each node onto the output layer. Now we should note that there can be any number of nodes per layer, 
and there are usually multiple hidden layers to pass through before ultimately reaching the output layer. This is a very simple example where we go from input data to a hidden layer to an output, but there are other types of artificial neural networks that are even more complex, that they have uh, multiple hidden layers, uh, deep learning mod, uh, machine learning techniques have multiple hidden layers before it gets to the output layer. Now choosing the right number of nodes and layers is important on when optimizing the neural network to work well on a given product problem. So understanding the trade-off between complexity and the predictive performance. You know, how many hidden layers you know, should we incorporate you know, based off of our input variables? You know, we have to look at, at these aspects. Well, why do we actually need these hidden layers? Why can't we just go straight from the input to the output with the weight function? Now take the following example. Now, this looks like a graph, but it's really a hyperplane. And it's the hyperplane between two, uh, two variables in this case. And we'll call them input 1 and input 2. I have a classification example where I want to put black dots flowing to one output. And then in the other case, I want to have the blue dots flowing to another output. So to create a classification, I have to create a line that separates these series of dots. And looking on the left-hand image, I can create a line very simply uh, that separates the two layers. And then this allows me to go straight from the input to the output. It's very clean and it's nice. And this line essentially comes from the weight connection of the input directly to the output. In this example, in the other example that I have on the right-hand side, is visually showing, well, what do I do when I have the classes where these four data points aren't as cleanly organized. I have a black dot in the bottom left hand corner and the upper right hand corner. Well I can't just create one line to separate them because if I choose a, a straight line I'm going to have one black dot on either side of it and that's an incorrect classification. So in this hyperplane we essentially have two lines okay, that are separating these uh, these observations. And if you look at this particular chart, we now have a black dot on the both sides of the lines, and then our two blue dots are within the middle. And that classification and the changing from a single input line to two input lines, it's really what the function of that hidden layer is doing. It's allowing for us to increase the dimensionality of the algorithm to, to essentially encapsulate data that's a little more spread out than we could with just a single linear separable line. So the first chart can separate all of the blue dots versus the black dots with a single line, or a hyperplane in this case. This linear representation does not require a hidden layer to classify the dots correctly. The second chart requires two lines, and it really is nonlinear to create a proper separation between the black and blue dots. This implies a need for a single hidden layer in addition to our input layer. Another important point is that in the previous example, the hyperplane that we were using was a straight line, which means that we use a linear activation function, i.e. a step function for our neuron. If we use the sigmoid function, or similar, the hyperplane would re represent a sigmoid shape as seen here. So instead of using the linear separator, by using the sigmoid function, we basically have this kind of S-shaped uh, curve. And this S-shaped curve creates a separation in, in a different manner. So depending on what type of neural network and the data that we're working with, we can use different types of functions to create the separations in the hyperplane. The threshold value shifts the hyperplane left and right while the weights orientate the hyperplane. In graphical terms, the threshold translates the hyperplane while the weights rotate it. This threshold also needs to be updated during the learning process. So the threshold value 
is shifting where this line is occurring. So as the neural network is going through the learning process, it's trying to decide where to put this threshold line. Do I keep it further down closer to you know, the xy axis, or do I shift it uh, up and to the right? How do I move this particular value? And the weights, you can think of it as pivoting these, these linear lines, if you will, to try to find the best combination of where these uh, these separators need to go in order to ensure that the classifications are correct. So this is kind of a visual way to think about thresholds and weights during the, the training process of a neural network. So you have to think that it's a biological system, it's trying to understand the environment, it creates a certain threshold and uses you know a certain initial starting weight but is that the best for this particular circumstance? And then it goes through a process in which it's calibrating this. And we call this uh, the learning aspect, which we'll get into a little bit in the upcoming slides. The learning rate term is a term that hasn't been mentioned before, and it is very important. It greatly affects the performance and accuracy of your network, and we'll get into this when we, when we talk about weight updates. Now let's talk about a multi-layer neural network. So when I have many different layers, we have our inputs on the left-hand side, and then we have a weight that goes from the input layer to the hidden layer. And then from the hidden layer to the output, we also have a second section of weights. So the square box at the bottom of this neural network are a threshold. They are our bias values. These neural networks are then hooked up to the rest of the network and they have their own weights and these are technically the threshold values. So in addition to the three inputs that we have and the three hidden nodes that we have that ultimately go out to three outputs, we have this hidden bias value. And this is you can think of this as almost kind of like its own variable that helps to train and work with the weights, connecting at different stages of our neural network. And this is really kind of the standard architecture for backpropagation neural network. And it's backpropagation because it's starting on the left-hand side and it's pushing the values to the front. Okay. So, so there are other styles of neural networks, but this is your standard architecture for backpropagation neural network. Now we need to update the weights in our neural network to get the correct output at the output layer. And this forms the basis of training of the neural network. So what do I mean by this? We will make use of the backpropagation for these weight updates. This just means input is fed in, the errors are calculated, and then it's filtered back through the network, making changes to the weights to try to reduce this error. Backpropagation is very powerful. It can learn any function given enough hidden units. With enough hidden units, we can generate any function. And that's a very powerful statement. So if we make very complex neural networks, we can use this learning technique, this backpropagation technique, to really model any type of environment. Now, these networks require extensive training, and there are many parameters to, to fiddle around with. They can be extremely slow to train, and may also fall into local minimum. So, while they're very powerful, they have drawbacks in terms of their performance. And it's inherently parallel algorithm. So, it's ideal for multiprocessor hardware. So, if we have multi-cores, then we want to spread the training of the algorithm and draw from our hardware constraints, having multiple cores to work with, we can actually do some parallel uh, processing with this algorithm. And despite the cons, it's a very powerful algorithm that has seen widespread successful deployment. Neural networks are very powerful, and 
even though they're difficult to understand and to explain to people in terms of its predictive performance and how it functions as a machine learning tool, uh, they're incredibly potent. The weight changes are calculated by using the gradient descent method. This means we follow the steepest path on the error function and we try to minimize it. All we're doing is we're just taking the error at the output neurons, the desired value minus the actual value, and we're multiplying it by the gradient of the sigmoid function. If the difference is positive, we need to move up the gradient of the activation function, and if it's negative, we need to move down the gradient of the activation function. So if I'm looking at an activation function here, and this is the sigmoid curve, and I'm trying to, in this case, trigger a one, I look at the actual value, and I say, okay, well, what's the distance between the two? And then I'm trying to close the gap in the next iteration of the learning of it. Uh, conversely, if I'm trying to get to a zero in this case, then I move uh, down and to the left. But visually, you can think of this function as just trying to close the gap between the desired value and the actual value. This is the formula to calculate the basic error gradient for each output neuron k. There is a difference between the error gradients and the output and hidden layers. The hidden layers error gradient is based on the output layers error gradient, the back propagation. So for the hidden layer, of it, the error gradient for each hidden neuron is the gradient of the activation function multiplied by the weight some of the errors at the output layer originating from that neuron. So we have to think of these error gradients at different stages throughout the development of our neural network. The final step in the algorithm is to update the weights, and this occurs as follows. The alpha value you see above is the learning rate. This is usually a value between 0 and 1. It affects how large the weight adjustments are, and so also affects the learning speed of the network. This value needs to be carefully selected to provide the best results. If it's too low, and it will take a long time to learn, too high, and the adjustments might be too large and the accuracy will suffer, as the network will constantly jump over a better solution and generally get stuck at a, some suboptimal accuracy. So this learning rate is a, a key tuning parameter of the neural network, and we have to look very carefully at configuring different learning rates. So in a lot of neural networks I use the rates of around 0.3, but sometimes you would use 0.5 or 0.7, and it just depends on the application and the complexity of the model that you're, uh, of the data that you're trying to model. So just understand that when working with artificial neural networks, you're going to have to specify some form of learning rate and you need to understand the trade-off between the learning rate specification. Let's now talk a little bit about the learning algorithm. The back propagation algorithm learns during a training epoch. You will probably go through several epochs before the network has sufficiently learned how to handle all the data you've provided and the end result is satisfactory. So neural network training is an iterative process. You're going to feed information in, and then it's going to learn from the information, and then you're going to feed it again, and it's going to continue to try to improve on the, on the model's performance. So here is a training epoch, and we're going to describe it below. So for each input entry in the training data set, we're going to feed input data in, and this is called feeding, feeding the forward. Then we're going to check the output against a desired value and feed back the error. So we're they're then going to back propagate. So we're going to feed the data back uh, to the inputs of the, the neural network. And this is where the back propagation consists of calculation of the error gradients and the update of the weights of the model. So if we go back and we look 
at our artificial neural network in a very simplistic sense. We have our inputs moving to the hidden layer, and then from the hidden layer to the output, which we're feeding forward, which is represented by the arrow down below. And then we actually have, uh, for each perceptron, we have the activation functions that we're looking at here. This information is can be viewed as, as feeding the data forward through the network, represented by the function signals, and pushing towards the output node. And then once we have the information related to the error of the neural network, we then have a back propagation of the weights, which then is just moving backwards to the start of the neural network and updating the various learning rates and the weight function. And we continue about this process until we give some type of stopping condition. And the stopping condition usually is a desired accuracy. We have a desired mean square error, or we have a certain number of training epochs that we're going to go through. So maybe we train it, you know, a, a thousand times, and then after a thousand times, we call it a day. What we have discussed so far is a form of supervised learning. And all supervised learning is that a teacher is telling the network what the correct output is based on the input until the network learns the target concept. So from a data standpoint, we know what our response variable is. We have it in our data set, and we're just feeding the information into an artificial neural network and say, understand the relationship of our independent variables to the dependent variable. And since we know what the dependent variable is, this is really a form of supervised learning. Now, we can actually also train networks where there is no teacher, and this is called unsupervised learning the network learns a prototype based on the distribution of patterns in the training data. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to discover the underlying structure of the data, to encode or compress the data, to transform the data. So imagine, if you will, I have a data set in which I don't have a response. But I want the neural network to decide what a 0-1 response should be based off of a uh, the input variables. So the neural network doesn't necessarily have to know what it is in front. It can define the structure through through the neural network itself. In a sense, it is learning based off of the information that's being provided without outside assistance. And that's really what allows neural networks to kind of mimic that biological process doesn't have to have a full understanding of the system in order to create uh, an understanding in a machine sense. So I don't want to say that supervised learning is better than unsupervised learning. They have different applications depending on how you're working with them. But neural networks and the way that it goes about mimicking biological processes uh, really opens up a whole new avenue in machine learning concepts. So this presentation will focus really on supervised learning form consisting of a feed-forward artificial neural network with back propagation. However, it's important to understand, like the human brain, there are many complexities within neural networks and different architectures that can be employed depending on the modeling task at hand. So this introduction really focuses on, on a very specific type of neural network. But if this is an area that interests you, you know, explore some of the the additional materials that are out there. You know, look up, you know, H2O's uh, deep learning module. You know, try to understand, you know, some of the additional, additional considerations when working with this powerful technique. Now that we've talked about artificial neural networks, I want to get into a couple of practical examples where we can see how we can employ them in predictive analytics and machine work. In this example, we're going to get into a binary response. Before we dive into the neural network, let's first take a look at the data set that we're looking at. This data set contains information on different banking clients who received a loan at least 10 years ago. 
The variable's income represents their annual income, their age, their loan, the size of their loan, uh, and the LTI, which is their loan to yearly income ratio, and it's readily available. Additionally, we know whether or not the individual has defaulted on this loan. So if they had not defaulted, we see a zero, and if they had defaulted, they have a one. Our goal in this example is to devise a neural network which predicts, based on the input variables, LTI and age, whether or not a default will occur within 10 years. Now, we could have fed all of the information into this model, but we're just going to focus on, on a smaller subset. So let's build a neural network with four hidden nodes. And the neural network is comprised of an input, hidden, and output nodes, as we talked about earlier. The number of nodes is chosen here without a clear method. However, there are some rules of thumb. So we decided that we're going to use four hidden nodes. But, but how did we decide that? Okay. The light sign option refers to the verbosity. The output is not linear, and we'll use a threshold value of 10%. Now, the neural net package in R uses a resilient backpropagation with weight backtracking as a standard algorithm. So, down below we have an example of the R code that we would use for building the neural network in this case. So, we're just specifying the hidden nodes equaling four. We're going to use the life sign minimal in this case. Um, it's not a linear output, and our threshold value is 0.1. Here is the resulting diagram of our neural network. As we can see on the left-hand side, we have our two variables of interest, LTI and age. And then we see in the diagram that these two points are connected to our hidden layer of four nodes. And then we have the various weights for each one of the input variables and the activation function. And at the end, on the right-hand side, we have our default tenure whether they have default or not. And at the bottom, we have our error rate and the number of steps it took during the training of our neural network process. So let's go ahead and let's test the neural network. Okay. Well, we created a random test sample of the data set, included only the client ID, age, and LTI variables. Okay, so we removed the known outcome from our original data set. And this data was not involved in the original training of the neural network, but we'll use it to validate the results from passing the data through the neural network. We talked more about uh, this type of classification evaluation in our decision tree tutorial earlier, so I'm not going to get in, into that and all the, the various methods that we could use, but I just want to showcase what the results show. So here is our example of our data set. We feed it through the neural network that we had just finished training, and out comes our data set in this case that shows the default, what it actually was, based off the known examples, and then we have an additional column that shows our prediction, which is saying a zero or a one, depending on, on the samples here. So we are able to, to feed new information into this process and find out what the exact prediction is showing. Now let's take a look at using a neural network for time series data. We haven't dived too much into time series, and we'll do that in, in a future tutorial. But I just want to show that the data can be very diverse that we use a neural network for. So here is uh, time series information. What we're going to do is we're going to look at the Hartnagel data set, which is from 1931 to 1968 and it's of different macroeconomic attributes of women in Canada. Okay. So we have the year that we're looking at, what the fertility rates are for women, what the labor force participation rate, uh, the women's post-secondary degree rate per 10,000, their women's con uh, conviction ratings, uh, their theft conviction ratings, and then as a contrast, we're going to look at male's uh, indictable offense conviction rate per 100,000 and their theft conviction rate. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to estimate using a neural network the F convict, okay, which is the women's indictable offense conviction rate per 10,000. Okay, and we're going to base it upon uh, the total fertility rate, the women's labor force participation rate, the women's post-secondary degree rate, and the men's indictable offense conviction rate per 100,000. Here's an example of what the data set actually looks like if we want to look at the structure of the data that we're working with. I want to show the information graphically so we can understand how the neural network is producing its results. When we look in this case, we see that the data follows a very uh, very telltale contour. It, it goes up to a certain point and then it kind of dips down into like a bowl, almost like a U type shape. Okay. So this data isn't a very clean uh, linear line. You know, a simple linear regression line would would not fit this data very well, okay, because of the time component that we have here. Now that we've talked a little about about the data structure, let's go ahead and train our neural network. In this case, we're going to use the AV neural net function from the caret package in R, which is going to feed produce a feed forward neural network with one hidden layer. The neural network specified here contains five nodes of the size of five in the hidden layer. The, de the decay parameter has been set to 0.3, and the argument repeats equals 25 indicates that 25 networks were trained and their predictions are to be averaged all throughout. So it's another type of neural network. We're using a different package in R to produce it, and we're controlling some of the parameters here up front. Now the argument line out true indicates that the output is obtained using a linear function. So as we have talked about the different types of functions, the sigmoid function as an example, we could uh, calibrate that depending on how the data looks. In this case, we're essentially um, building a linear uh, function. As we can see, the results here indicate that the neural network didn't really fit this time series very well. I mean, we do see in the dashed line that there is a small hump uh, that is moving upwards that it's trying to uh, model the peak, and then it goes down into a trough into our U-shaped bow. And it does mimic it to a certain degree, but doesn't capture all of the nuances. So I think it's important when we're looking at it utilizing predictive analytics and designing the experiments to apply the algorithms that we're not always going to see you know a one for one fit to the data. You know, predictive analytics is a measurement science and as such we have to use the right tool for the job. Is a neural is a neural network the correct tool for this time series data? Probably not, but we do see that it is capable of you know understanding these nuances at certain levels perhaps with more tweaking of the parameters and changing the variables and the learning function using different types of functions, we can increase its accuracy. Our final example that we'll go into today is a categorization example. So I just wanted to continue to demonstrate the strength of neural networks uh, in, a, in a different type of exercise. Before we begin, let's take a look at the data set. In this data set, we actually have three species of the genus Iris. We have Setosa, Virginica, and Versicolor. So of the Iris flowers, we have these, these species, and they all kind of exhibit their own characteristics. So if you just take a look at these pictures here, you can tell that they're all very similar in terms of color pattern, but they have some different nuances which make them distinct. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to understand, based off of certain measurements and characteristics, uh, how we can classify uh, unknown samples into these three classes. And specifically, the measurements we're going to look at is 
the pedal length and width and the symbols length and width. If I look at the data set here, I have these measurements laid out and to the right hand side I have the species and what, what is known. So in this case these are the Setosa uh, iris. So the data set contains information on different measurements of iris flowers and the species related to these measurements. Our goal here is to devise a neural network which classifies species based on the sepal and petals of various lengths and widths. When we're working with this data set and trying to get a reasonable result, one thing I had to do in the R language is I actually had to create dummy variables. Okay, normally I don't show the R code here, but I wanted to walk into this example a little bit just so we can see how the neural network performs and that in certain instances, we have to use data transformations to get the results that we want. So in this example, I took the species of Setosa and I categorized it as a two. I took a, a Versilica ones and I put it as a zero and I put Virginica as a one. And if you see down below, we actually have our neural network trained. And in the example, I have the output with a different uh, sepal lengths and widths and the petal lengths and widths. So we will build our neural network with four hidden nodes. The number of nodes is chosen here without a clear method. However, there are some rules of thumb. Okay, the life sign option refers to verbosity. And the output is not linear and we'll use a threshold value of 10%. The neural net package uses a resilient back propagation with weight backtracking as a standard algorithm. So the number of nodes chosen here, I didn't, we don't want to choose 50 nodes if our data set has you know, only four pieces of information. So we want to reduce the complexity as much as possible. So I opted in this case to say, okay, I have four variables that I'm measuring in this case. I'm going to have one hidden uh, layer and I'm going to have one node for each one of these just to control it. I could have gone with three or two. In this example, I just felt like going with four. When we produce the neural network, we now see this uh, diagram. On the left-hand side, we have our sepal length, our sepal width, our petal length, and our petal width. We have our four hidden nodes, or our one hidden layer, and the four nodes in that hidden layer. And then we have our final classification showing Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica on the right-hand side. Now this could have all been pared down to one output node uh, with three values. It's just the way that we had drawn uh, and applied our neural network in this case. But as we can see, we have all of our weights and our thresholds um, from this back propagation feed forward artificial neural network. Observing our neural network result. Well, we created a random test sample from the data set that only included the sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width variables. This data was not involved in the initial training of the neural network, and we'll use it to validate the results passing the data through the neural network. So I'm taking a data set that it has the actual observation, uh, the actual classifications stripped out. So all I have are just numeric values. I'm going to feed it into our neural network, and then out I'm going to see a result. And in this case, we see next to our data set, we have the known species and then we have our prediction to the right-hand side. And from this, we can go about all of our metrics in terms of accuracy uh, that we had discussed in uh, previous lectures. Thank you very much for joining me today. I enjoyed walking through the topic of artificial neural networks with you. If this topic or other topics interest you, feel free to make some comments on my channel. Uh, we can have a discussion about these topics in, in greater detail. And thank you very much.